Yo, welcome to another episode of the BJJ Goons Podcast. I'm your host, Tim, the Mushmaster Spriggs. And with me as always is... Hey, it's your co-host, Nico Ball, no new Nico. Last week, I think I was so out of it. One week, I introduced myself as actually no new Nico. That was a mistake. I meant to say my real name. <laughs> hey, you become your nickname, man. I it's know, just right? Just accept it. You know, <laughs> when I walk the streets... I could call Jits Bay a lot, you know? I just accept it, you know? It's I think you did game. that to me. You're the one with all the AKAs. And people always ask me, like, my dad started off asking me, and then somebody else was like, you should ask Tim why he has the AKAs. I was like, you asked him. He's a big dude. I'm not. Hey, you know, brothers got to have mad nicknames, man. You know how it go. It's like yeah. Wu-Tang Clan. They got, like, five nicknames per member. That is very true. That is very true. So what's new with you? What's going on in the world of No New Nico? Uh, well, speaking of Wu Tang Clan, like my favorite group, this is completely unjujitsu related, but my favorite, one of my favorite rap groups, they're like an Angolan rap group that lives in Portugal. Uh, they just dropped a new album, and they remind me of like the Angolan Wu Tang Clan. That's what made me think of it. But uh, one of them dropped a new album today, so I've been trying to like download that and listen to it, and uh, had to interrupt my listening with this podcast. So I'm going straight back to that. <laughs> So, like, what is it like? Like, What is Angolan rap like? What do they talk about? Well, I mean, they talk about a lot of the same kind of stuff as American hip-hop will. Like, I know a lot of people that do jiu-jitsu have listened to, like, Brazilian funky, and all Brazilian Uh funky has that same beat. And, like, most of it, it talks about sex and stuff like that. But, like, this group, they actually talk about, you know, like, growing up on the street and, like, just stuff like your typical... U.S. hip hop group would talk about so and then this album has a lot of really cool instrumentals like they got a lot they got a reggae mix they got a lot of really dope beats that I was posting on my Instagram stories you know I was like sitting here getting ready setting up all the lighting and then one of the songs hit me with like this crazy beat at the beginning I was like what so yeah so I'm going straight back to that after this that's what's up you know speaking of for the culture what do you think about this whole Breonna Taylor incident, man? Like, I, it's been a rough week. Like, I try to stay positive. A lot of things are going well, but it's like the hits keep on coming, man. What do you man. think about all that? That's been, that's been a super rough one, man. Like, I actually found out about the verdict off of, again, Instagram. It was a Ray that posted it, you know, and I was blown. It's like the only people that got charged were the people that missed. Damn. The way you put it is just so simple, but like so poignant. Like, if you think about it, drywall got more rights and got more respect in a person's life. Like, you could shoot a black woman, no problem here, but you shoot some drywall, it's your ass. And I don't even think, did he even get like locked up for it? Or did he get burned, t- turned into custody, or is it just like a slap on the wrist? I'm not exactly Man, sure what that no, charge he got, is. Uh, he, I think he got charged with reckless endangerment. It was Something the charge. Like I didn't even like. I didn't even actually follow up on it when I realized, you know, like the actual situation. It's just, it's really hard to to see something like that, like to internalize the fact that somebody breaks into your house, riddles you with bullets, and the only person that got charged was the people that missed, and you know, lot, hundreds of people that protested. They also got charges. A lot of them felony charges. <laughs> yeah, I, I was hearing they were setting a bail out that was higher than for the guys that actually did the shooting. Like, I think you would get like at least six figure bail if you got caught out there protesting. It's like very depressing to me. I've said this before on the podcast. I know of several people that were out protesting that got pepper sprayed, gassed, all that crazy shit. And to think, you know, you had the NBA saying, say the more specifically, the WNBA saying, say her name. They dedicated the season to this young woman and to see such a miscarriage of justice or lack thereof, no justice whatsoever is just very troubling and very disheartening and it makes me wonder if i want to stay here do you understand what i mean like because i do martial arts and i've done it at such a high level it makes me want to say like maybe the option of living in this country long term is not great 
I know the other people that I talk to my age or around that age, they're saying the same thing. Like, I don't want to raise a family here if this is what it's going to be. You know, whenever I turn on the news, I see things that I would have never thought I would see in a million years. Basically, the person in office saying they're not, if they lose, they're going to be a sore loser and not accept the L. And then you see. <laughs> that is another, cr- oh my God, I didn't even think about RBG dying. RBG uh, died. Like, uh, I per- the week started off when I was like, Tim, we got to talk about this Kamala Harris, Tim situation. That was how we the week, that we was need to. That's the very problem. Impressive at the beginning of the week and then we go into rbg and then the brianna taylor verdict and it has been definitely a crazy week it's a typical week in 2020 you feel me but uh it's scary bro like if to think you know it's very odd to me how people switch up depending on the situation i'll give you an example so typically for all my people that are into firearms and home safety we're martial artists so i know a lot of martial artists that are into all aspects of self-defense you would think that if someone kicks in your door waving the 4-4 that you can protect yourself and your family and everyone will be supportive of that but now all of a sudden everyone i see people even people i know saying like well she'd be alive if that guy wasn't shooting back like what what's going on here so yeah it's been a very disheartening thing like do you really want to live here like if you if you travel like you travel around the world nico so you understand the options there are i mean it's not perfect anywhere but oh don't think, ask like, me you could dm me if you would like a list of the options like i said my favorite rap ghoul group lives in portugal portugal is actually really nice i've only ever been to one city in europe but europe you know it's really nice compared to america the people are a lot nicer over there the music is really nice sintra like suburbs outside of lisbon great place probably to open a jujitsu gym hit me up if you're interested I went on a trip to Europe, man, and it changed my perspective. I've been on a few trips to Europe, but for my birthday last year, I was thinking to myself, and this was before all this crazy shit happened, I was like, ah, I could really live here. Like, I feel comfortable. I feel relaxed, you know? I mean, it's not like it's perfect, but it's like, whew, like, I don't feel like I'm in danger everywhere I go. <laughs> but, uh, that is yeah, man. a bad reality. And I don't think enough people actually realize that because enough well, enough Black people don't leave the U.S. to realize. <laughs> uh, the last few guests have been putting me on to like, maybe I should go back to Africa. Like, we, just see my roots. Like, see what's up, you know? Your original co-host dipped out and he won't come back. <laughs> like, Yes, dude. DJ Jackson oh, is like, in Thailand. He he's found love again and like he's living his best life. He's laughing at us like, damn, is it really he he DMs me sometimes like, damn, is it really that bad over there? Like, yes, man. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he saved me. On the beach too. He's just running on the beach, like, oh man. So man, maybe 2021 <laughs> is gonna have a black exodus of the US. Uh, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe that will happen, but check it. You know, since we're talking about like representation and since we're talking about, you know, all our guests and how we're all about diversity, we have a very special guest this week. And the theme for this week is life as a gym owner. Our guest this week is going to be Dion Thompson. He is the only owner, and he's a black man, he runs the only black owned martial arts BJJ school in Northwest Ohio. This man is a second degree black belt under seven time world champion, Rodrigo Comprido Medeiros. Do you know who Comprido is? Um, you call me out on that. I've heard the name. I couldn't pick out his picture. Okay, Comprido is an <laughs> absolute BJJ legend. He is a former open weight champion in the black belt worlds in the gi. One of the I mean, first yeah. American black belts, correct? One, he's like Amer- one of his, one of Rodrigo Comprido's first uh, American black belts. If you don't know Comprido, look him up and also take a guess in what UFC champion he helped train. 
Oh, you, you really taking the time that we don't have the guests here to pop quiz me. I'm calling you out. Yes, I'm sorry. Damn. I'm trying because a In lot Ohio, of people don't know. I'm a UFC ju- champion. I don't know. You didn't have to call me out. You could have called our Brock Lesnar. He was Brock Lesnar's jujitsu coach. Dang, I'm over yes. two. I'm over two. I got over two on my guest study. Sorry, guys. I mean, listen, Dion has a lot of placements you know 2011 master's division pan silver medalist the time chicago open master's division champion i mean the man has won a lot he's also the owner of ohio braza and has five affiliates five you know this is something yeah five not one not two not three not four in ohio five affiliates in ohio so i guess he's running things over there and I've never sat down on this show and talked to a school owner and someone that owns affiliates. Like I've always been wondering, like, how does that work? I know that I'm on Team Lloyd Irvin, but I don't, I still don't understand the affiliate business. So, you know, that's what I want to learn from him this week. But uh, I have a question for you, Nico. Not another pop quiz, but this is, this is kind of like, all right. Would you want to be involved in starting and or running a gym? Or have you ever been involved with that? I guess you might have with Favela Jiu-Jitsu. See, that's the hard part. Like, I don't, like, I don't even know. Running a gym is really hard. I do, I guess my optimal job would be, like, consulting because I work with social projects and people want to work with social programs. Like, Mm -hmm. I could see myself being a partner in a gym, but I don't think I would want to be a principal owner because ownership is a lot of work. (laughs) What about you? Now, definitely not. I don't (laughs) think I would want to run an academy during these times. It's already stressful as it is to run an academy. I've lived and been around gyms for the better part of my life now, probably Damn, like almost half my life now I've spent around gyms. So I understand the back end part. I know what it is to be a student, but I also know what it's like to work at a gym. I never put my own money in to run a, my own brick and mortar spot. But before that, I knew that it was a type of stress that I don't really think I would want to handle. And now with all the stresses, everything that's going on with schools closing left and right, I do not really want to have my own brick and mortar facility. I'm happy with teaching online. I'm happy with doing private lessons, but as far as running an academy, I don't think I'm about that life. And a lot of people aren't, but I'm, I tap out. Like, I don't think that's for me. Now I've been told though, like with everything that's going on, there are a lot of people looking for black owned gym owners and, or just people that make them feel comfortable. So that is the bright side of things that, you yeah it's becoming a market for people of different backgrounds to open their own academies. And that's the beautiful part about an art like jujitsu, even though some people will try to make it just for us by us, as far as them, like now it's opening up where people can have a choice and now jujitsu is spreading to the people. Yeah. And it's not necessarily always a matter of being a black owned gym. Um, I mean, we always are definitely going to support the people and support the cause, but it's a matter of, like, I heard, like, a lot of pa- people or Black people don't take the initiative to vote, whether they have felonies or charges that keep them to vote, whether they don't believe in the system or whether they don't want to, but, you know, uh, money is power. So if you put your money into organizations, gyms, groups, people that you want to support, you know, that really goes a long way. And I think after coming out of the riots, we really need to realize, you know, like buying black or buying local community and stuff like that like where you spend your money like really matters so don't give your money to people that you don't really support and speaking of that make sure you guys go to favela jujitsu.com and buy us buy yourselves some merch okay buy yourself some mush master gear buy yourself my brother's keeper gear buy yourself favela jujitsu gear you gotta support we gotta support our own You know, I've been talking to a lot of instructors while we're discussing that, and I'm hearing a lot of schools are having to shut down. Have you heard anything about some of your friends in Mm -hmm. academies across the country? I know, Coyotera shut down. Mm -hmm. I heard. Was it his flagship in San Jose? Uh Uh-huh. 
they they, they were getting wow. them charged and then as in dc as i call him the clipboard man clipboard man keep coming by telling people you know two thousand dollars if you have no mask and uh he got hit they told him i think it was like four thousand two thousand if they call him teaching classes again you know they shut him down i know i don't know if i should call out i'm not gonna call him out they kind of ft affiliated i know it's one gym that's in cali but they're inside of like an office building so they've been training like this whole time i had a friend who's preparing for pants he's like yeah i was over there nobody knows me in there i was like all right bet more power to you but kyle definitely closed down what is your opinion on people snitching because i know that a lot of people are training but I, I, I hear a lot of people getting caught and I know that they're not sending people out there like that, are they? Are people I mean, just snitching is is. or is it just an initiative? Uh, I mean, even Master Lloyd told me that, like uh, PM competition training is back, but I, like I, I'm AM competition training and uh, I'm still not, I'm gonna let the first wave of competitors go into the gym. Like, you know, I still train with a group of closed people. I, I don't know, I'm still weird about Corona. I'm still a little weirded out. I don't Yo. snitch, though. I don't snitch. Oh, I never snitch. What? <laughs> Listen, no snitches allowed at the BJJ Goons podcast, okay? If you're a snitch, turn this off. Go go do something. Change your personality. Do something Do something with your life. Uh, I do I talk, had, though. Does that count? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not, I, th- I guess snitching has to be in your heart. I, I don't know. Like, technically, you're snitching, like you're dry snitching like, unintentionally. But, you know, you're just trying to, pub- as long as you don't drop location. Do, Tim, it's what all the rappers do. No. Uh, hey, this, <laughs> we do not condone snitching on the BJJ Goose podcast. You know, we might have to remake the stop snitching video, but for jujitsu. You know, like I play like Carmelo, you know what I mean? Like, hey, yo, stop snitching. That's what we should do. That should be our next video project. While we're on the subject of the Rona, I have to tell you a story, Nico. So you know how last night, I guess last night or yesterday, I had like ask me anything, right? Mm -hmm. And somebody asked me, Tim, do you feel comfortable going to pans and I gave an honest answer I didn't say people were wrong for going to pans I didn't say that people were evil for out training like people have to adjust to what they feel comfortable because this is a changing situation you know sometimes the science is one thing sometimes it says others you know but some things are more irresponsible than others but I'm not here to I guess atmosphere shame if you want to train train but at your own risk i'm just against some of the things that people are doing nonetheless i say that i don't feel comfortable because i don't trust where these people have been that sounds pretty reasonable right nico is that fair sounds good see how i wasn't derogatory right so somebody goes into my dms is like do you really care about the rona like are you really afraid i was like and then he sent me some picture and like you know how people send those pictures with like it's like a time stamp thing where like you click it and like you open it in and it has like a time limit to how long you can look at it mm-hmm. so it's basically this picture of like these numbers and like ages and i'm like what the hell is this what are you sending me i guess statistics and i'm like yes hell yeah i'm scared and like no shit like yeah i'm worried because i'm like yeah I don't want to catch an infectious disease. Like, is there something wrong with that for me saying it? Because you know when people ask that, they're copping an attitude with you. Like, they're trying to say, oh, you're really worried about this infectious disease that shut down everything? I'm like, yeah, bro. He's like, why are you so mad? Why are you so... I'm like, well, I'm not mad. I'm just saying, no shit, I'm scared. Like, aren't you? That's like, people keep saying that to me, too. It's like, somebody was like, oh, you worried about, like, your eye? Like, you're not doing something because of your eye? I was like, no, like, coronavirus. No, going to Brazil. They're like, you you worried about going to Brazil because of your eye? I was like, no, I'm worried about leaving and like hitting all of the highest cities in the world, you know, in one in one trip. Like, are you not like they're like, oh yeah. Like, so so anyway, like he's like, You're a young athlete, dude. You have nothing like slow down. Who are you to tell me how or what I should do with my body? Another subject that's probably gonna pop up now because the whole RBG thing about my agency over my body what i want to do is like yes i am still concerned because i personally know of people close in my close family circle that have gotten it have gotten really really fucking sick 
I know of people younger than me that have died. So this whole like, oh, you're an athlete, it's no big deal. You should just do it because I think you should do it. Like that's kind of, what is the word I'm looking for? Entitled. It's kind of like an entitled attitude. Like what's wrong with you? You should do it. Like I kind of feel as though people pressure people to do things just because it would be convenient and give them some semblance of normalcy. And I think that's kind of like the thing I'm getting from people. Like they'll shame you for wanting to be cautious about your body and what you want to do. And I feel it's so they think that because people are cautious, it's ruining their fun time. I think that's the issue a lot of people are having with it. But I just, I just think it's like, dude, don't come into my DMs and try to tell me how I should feel about what I'm going to do with myself. You yeah. feel me? I don't feel the same way about those people. You know, I don't have time for that. Yeah. It is what it is. Yo, welcome to the show, Dion. Earlier, we did a little introduction, told the world about you a little bit. But can you introduce yourself and tell the world who you are and what you do? Well, first of all, I am nowhere near as popular or famous as you two. So I want to thank you guys for, for uh, talking to the little guy today. You know what I mean? I, I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Dion Thompson. I'm a Raza Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt under seven-time world champ Rodrigo Caprito from Toledo, Ohio. Representing the Midwest out here. Also, uh, I'm an analyst for Buckeye Cable Sports Network. Um, Man, I wear a bunch of different hats here, you know what I mean? But I really, like I said, I thank you guys for just allowing me to uh, to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in our area. Yeah, that's what's up. You just finished teaching literally right now, didn't you? Literally, literally. So I'm a little sweaty and, and, and that sort of thing. But you guys are jujitsu people. You guys know what's up. Oh, yeah, we know how the grind is. So are you guys back to normal classes or what's up over there? We are back. We were back. Our, I think Ohio, our governor did a great job. Uh, by the way, shouts out to DeWine. We came back a lot earlier than a lot of people um, did. And, uh, you know, so we've been kind of full go at it. You know, we're obviously observing the uh, governor's mandates and that sort of thing, but, but we're ready to go. You know, we are, uh, a few of us actually are going to the pans in two weeks now. So myself included. So Hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll see how those results come out. But, yeah, we've been, back, we've been back at it. That's what's up. So were you on lockdown for a while? Like, did you ever have to close the academy for a little bit? Or were you guys still going straight through? How did that work? No, no we were on lockdown actually for, I want to say like six weeks, a couple months. So we were on lockdown, and I had to shut the academy down. You know, it's funny, man. Um, that gave me a lot of time to really think about some things and just realize how lucky I am because COVID slowed a lot of people down, you know what I mean? Myself included. But the blessing was I continued getting phone calls over the whole break, man. And when I came back, you know, my school has just literally been just, just getting so many new members and I'm really happy for that. I think a lot of schools around here had the same issue, which isn't an issue. So it's a good thing. Wow. That's a, you said you guys are only shut down for like a couple months? Yes, we, we weren't like you guys on the East Coast. And uh, Michigan had it bad, too. They just opened up. But, you know, um, I think we were one of the first states, though, to shut down. You know, we shut a lot of things down, and we tried to curb it. But, you know, for the most part, I think Ohio's done a, an outstanding job of dealing with this uh, pandemic. Hmm. Yeah, awesome. no. We can't listen over here, that's for sure. Oh, not at all. Are you, you guys aren't back yet? Mm, kind of, sort of. It depends um, on where. <laughs> no, we don't even go there. I got you. <laughs> I, was at, no, I was at Crazy 8, like, but doing some filming stuff, doing some filming and lighting, and I saw Vanessa, and she said they were back to normal classes, and I was like, oh, really? Like, I didn't realize when the grocery store started staying open past 8 o'clock, it took me, like, it wasn't until, like, a month later that I was like, oh, yeah, I can go to the grocery store after work again? That's fantastic. Like, because oh, I man. try to stay away from people, so. Yeah, it, it's the little things, honestly, that you appreciate during this time, the little luxuries that that you just assume, you know, were there. Now it's just like, wow, yeah, like, so I can go to the grocery store, I can get out. But it was tough for a little bit, you know. 
Boy, sure. So, Dion, today the theme is talking about the life of a gym owner. And I'm assuming that in order to own a gym, from my experience, most of the people that own them teach and run classes. When did you start training and how long into your training did you decide that you wanted to own slash run a gym? Interesting story. So I started around 2000. A lot of people may not know this, but uh, Salo and Shanji Hibero, they were in Toledo for six years. Ashanji mentions it a lot. So I started there at a guy named Chris Blanky. Shouts out to him, by the way. He and I are good friends. He brought jujitsu kind of to Toledo. But the weird thing about it, man, it was only maybe six to 10 of us in that class. Now, you got two world champions here, and people, they just didn't uh, understand it. So around 2006, I, it, for me, I started older. You know, I was 33, 34 when I started. So I'm in my 50s now. So you know, I was like kind of late to the party, but I always coached. I always, you know, I played uh, division one basketball and that sort of thing. So it was always, for me, I love competing too. So it was kind of a, I didn't seek out to do it, but some circumstances uh, led me to having to kind of venture out. And then that's where I, I met my professor now, uh, Rodrigo Comprito. And at the time, you know, I was just, trying to train and I, and I started a little MMA gym just kind of teaching guys and you know back in those days you couldn't give the jujitsu away a lot of people were non-believers and I was a purple belt which back in let's say what 2005 2006 it wasn't a whole lot of them around you know so um then I ended up getting my own spot and you know man there was a guy he said man you ought to branch out and get your own spot like I was kind of co-renting at karate schools and things like that. So, and I said, man, I don't know. So literally I took all my savings and it was such a risk. I was scared, I was nervous. I didn't know because jujitsu just wasn't big in the Midwest or in Toledo in particular. Um, so I stepped out, man, and I was really surprised that people just started coming. And as they say, the rest is history. What, five affiliates later, you know, so it's, it's worked out really well, but I want to tell everybody who undertakes this venture, be patient. It's like anything else. Like you guys have names, so it won't be as difficult for you. I had a name, but not kind of in jujitsu. People kind of knew me from sports. People knew me from like the TV stuff and my regular job as a social worker. So that's how I kind of could wrangle people into me just because they kind of knew me and was curious. So yeah, so now, man, it just, it does really well. Wow, so when you started the gym, was it just you, or did you have other people that would help you teach classes, or run the front desk, or? Uh, it was me. It was me doing everything. <laughs> I kind of, like, you know, like I have black belts now, I want to give a shout out to uh, Katie Sweet. She's a black belt. She's Pan Am silver medalist, world's in the third, third place, Matt Garber. Uh, another pan and world medalist. They're black belts now, but they when I first started, they were kind of white belts. And you guys know, trying to leave a white belt running the gym. And I started as a purple belt, which I want to say it's not, I do not advise anybody to do that. Like, <laughs> oh, I know wow. so much more now, because when I was early, earlier as a purple belt, my goal was to just try to prove how good I was at jujitsu. I'm surprised those guys actually stayed with me. So <laughs> shouts out to those guys. But um, yeah, for, I was doing everything. Uh, I was doing the books. I was... It was tough, but through that, I learned so many other skills and uh, I, I was able to pass the, the game down, so to speak, to my other students. So now I have a kid's class where I have blue and purple belts, uh, Vicente, Sasha, they, they run that class. So it's, it's kind of nice now, but at first it really wasn't that easy. I can only imagine. Now, so you were wearing a lot of hats at the time. And I'm assuming that you were still competing, right? Yeah, I was competing. So, you know, for me, like I said, I, I, it was important to compete around here. So my goal was to try to make a little a name for myself locally and to also build up a little a local student base. So I figured I had to get out there. And that was one thing that my early instructors, you know, really stressed. I know Chris Blanky, he was big on that. And I, and, and I want to touch on that, too. A lot of people feel like, well, oh man, you know, people say, check your ego in at the door. We've all heard that, right? 
I think ego too is when you don't step out there and you're an instructor because you're, you're afraid you might lose in front of your students and how they're going to view you. Guys, don't do that. Just get out there because what I did, if nothing else, it, it made me connect to people. I made a lot of contacts. And then I was able to share my experiences, wins and losses with my students. You know, it's kind of difficult to, to share something if you've never done it before. So I think that's where people had confidence in, in what I was teaching. It's always tight when you can see your instructor compete. When I was coming up, my coach Julius Park was still competing. And one of my earliest tournament memories was watching him put a guy to sleep from bottom of half guard. Like he had the shin in front half guard. He went yeah. cross choke, had it in, <laughs> held it. And, you know, at the time I'm new, so I don't really understand how grips work and wrist and hand placement. And I thought he was a damn Jedi. Like he just was like, here, <laughs> help. Guy went to Tim, sleep, I have, I have, he let go I have, and locked off. I have a funny story about you, Tim. What's good? You think we just met, but we actually met years and years ago, okay? You were a blue belt. You competed in the Chicago Open. Yes. Yes, you did. And they, had I, the best, I, they had the best shirt that year, too. Yeah, I, I was in that, and a lot of my students were in that, and I'll never forget my black belt, Matt Garber, now, you know, because we would see the Lloyd Irvin guys. And one thing we always knew about you guys, like, okay, they're going to be in shape. These guys are tough. And uh, Matt Gar's like, man, you see that guy? He's like, no, who is it? Matt, that's, that's Tim Spriggs. Man, he's one of the best blue belts in the world. And I'm watching, man. Your game was real. It was different than it is now. It was like, <laughs> it, was so serious. it was smooth. I'm watching you, you know, all over. I said, man, I said, who are these guys, man? And you just look great. And I think after the match or whatever, we walked by. I said, hey, man, you know, you did a good job. You're like, you're real polite to me, but you didn't remember me. You know, because I know a lot of people probably come up to you guys he's like hey man thanks and that was like our first meeting and that was that had to be oh seven maybe oh eight i don't know where you're blue that's yeah. Yeah, it was ages but, yeah, ago so, man i know crazy how, how life circles back you know crazy now when i first asked you to be on the show you mentioned that you were the first and or only bjj African-American BJJ or martial arts school owner in Northwest Ohio. Yes. Uh, the first BJJ and the only black martial arts school owner, period. Karate, jujitsu, anything. So, yeah, man. And it's, it's weird because I didn't think of it like that until somebody brought it to my attention. You know, there was a guy by the name of Maurice Freeman, and this was around, man, about seven years ago. Outstanding martial artist. He's done, he's one of those guys, older guys. You know, everybody got the OG that knows all the different martial arts. So he says, he comes into my school and he introduces himself. He's like, man, I just want to tell you, I'm proud of you because you were able to do something that none of us were able to do. And that's to have a sustainable academy through martial arts. And at the time, I didn't think of it because the majority of my students are, are not African-American, you know, if I'm being honest, which... We'll touch on that too, which is awesome. But I was like, wow. So then in Ohio, there's another guy named Dustin Ware, but there's like two of us in Ohio, literally. And you guys know how big the state is. Mm -hmm. And I don't know of any in Chicago. I'm not sure there's any in Indiana. I know there's this one up in a uh, couple in, in Michigan, my buddy Tyrone Gooden. Uh, he's up there. So, but yeah, man, it's uh, it was uh, interesting to, to think about it like that. So what was that like? I know you mentioned that not a lot of your students were of African-American descent. You said you wanted to go over that. What has yeah. that been like? Did you have any obstacles in that? Was it hard to get people to believe that you knew about Brazilian jiu-jitsu? Because I know Master Lloyd talks about it a lot, that when he first stepped out and was striking out on his own, people were kind of non-believers because it's like, hey, it's a brother from the DMV, DC, Maryland, Virginia, for people who don't know. Yeah. And it's he's doing a Brazilian art, and it's already weird for Americans to do it for for a brother. We don't like see a lot of us in the sport as it is. So, can you talk a little bit about that and how it was breaking ground and being the first? Yeah, well, the thing about it, man, um, and I tell this to a lot of people, like all my affiliates, they're all they're all white guys. Majority of my students are white. And I said this one time, it was kind of funny. I said, you know, even though I have a large student base, I'm sure it's probably somebody that looked at the website and said, ah, we may go somewhere else, you know? 
I have a, <laughs> I'm just saying, you know. But the reality of it is, Tim, man, and I don't want to seem like I'm in a vacuum, but I don't know if I faced a lot of uh, a lot of issues in that sense. And I'll tell you how, why I say that, because I run the Buckeye State Grappling Championships, which is a jiu-jitsu tournament. I throw every July. And it's the biggest tournament in Ohio, the biggest local tournament, man, where I draw upwards to 500 people, 400 plus, you know, which is big for a local tournament. And all those people continue to come back. So I said to myself, I must be doing something right. You know, if I have people of other uh, ethnicities that want to come. And even, even now, man, you'd be surprised that in this region, how many people reach out to me to maybe want to come to a seminar or, you know, or want to check my class out. So I can honestly say I haven't knowingly really seen it, you know, but it was funny. I, I ran into Lloyd at the Pan Ams two years ago when you were out there and he and I were the only black guys in the coaching box, the only black belt that were coaching. It's like, man, you know, it kind of struck me. And I said, man, it's really not a lot of us that do it. And I don't know what it is with brothers and jujitsu. I know in, in my area, everybody's in the boxing and that sort of thing. And they'll try a class. And we all know this. Both you guys understand. You got to kind of go through that grind where you get beat down. So your ego is checked, man, at first. And I don't know how many of us like that. I don't know. It just, so. Nico, I think when we interviewed I think it was Malachi or somebody that was like, I was kind of hesitant to do jujitsu because it looked kind of gay. And I, I think that's a major <laughs> thing. It is, because yeah. when I was in college, yeah. I was showing brothers like, yo, this is what I do. You know, I'm trying to be a world champion. They look at me like, bro, that's kind of gay. And like, it'll throw people off. Like, it sucks that homophobia would take you out of something that could save your life. But Dion, I agree. That's, that's real. And the beating suck. And getting beat on, you can't hide in jujitsu. Yeah, that's true. It's very that's humbling. Really it's very humbling. You you know you can't be cool. You know what I mean. You know our people tend that we like that coolness factor. Right. And, yeah. and it's nothing cool about getting <laughs> choked by some little nerdy dude with some glasses on. <laughs> you bumped into at the club that you'd be able to handle. And I'm gonna tell you something. That's really what got me, man. I went, and uh, you know, I see it was Saco actually at first. I'm like. Little, I didn't know about Brazil. It's like, man, this little Mexican guy. I said, let me try this out. A guy named Chris Blank. Chris is every bit of five six, man. <laughs> These guys are twisting me. I'm six six. These guys are twisting oh, wow. me every which way. And I'm like, hold on a second. So in my mind, instead of saying, let me go lift some more weights, I said, I gotta learn this. Because at the time, I was hanging out at the time and going places, and I didn't want to get embarrassed. So it kept me 20 years later, I guess. Even the guys from Monster Maker, I have them on video because when I was there with DJ and Yara, they're like, no, Lloyd keeps inviting us over to that gym. We ain't going to that. They're going to choke us out. They'd be like, no, no. <laughs> like, they know exactly what it is. Strong that football ego. players, too. Big dudes. They're not messing with that jujitsu. They show it its respect, hey. but a lot of people don't know what it is or understand. You know, I think now it's coming more to the forefront um, because a lot of people are into the UFC and that sort of thing. And we've been blessed too, like the Braza Association, man. We, we got some guys, obviously you guys know about Kyle Terra, mm -hmm. uh, Damian Maya, Stipe, believe it or not, Stipe Miosic, he, he's a guy from Strong Style Braza in Cleveland, which is my buddy Pablo's uh, Castro. He's a world champion, his gym. So he's been here a couple of times. So, you know, I, I honestly, man, think in the Midwest, you guys are doing it good, but if you look at us in the Midwest, and I've often said this to people, but you guys are at the top of the podium. But if you look at guys on, on the podiums, man, we got a real good jujitsu scene and our guys just love to compete. So that's why I always wanted to, uh, I'm glad you guys had me on here because I got to shout my guys out. I got to shout my guys from Detroit Jiu Jitsu. Tim, you know about those guys. Nico, we got to get you here too, by the way. Yeah, but, yeah uh, for sure. I miss yeah, you know, like... yeah, it, it, you know, it, Tim, Tim came a couple years ago. Tim, we took care of you, didn't we? It was a blast. The guys in Detroit, BJJ, hooked me up. I like the Midwest. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, uh, we're tough here. See, people think we're just football and hoop and wrestling. We got a little jujitsu. Like I said, we're, we're trying to get to the level of you guys. Not, not quite yet, but we're getting close. I think Real wherever close. you have wrestlers, like, you have the potential for some really vicious jujitsu. Oh, listen. Then you guys, I know you guys interviewed my guy, Dante Leon. Here's the other thing. I want to shout him and his gym out. 
Dante's gym is less than a, probably maybe a mile from mine. Oh, and wow. that's what people think. People think it's weird. There's three jujitsu gyms within four miles and we don't hate on each other. You know what I mean? We all just like, because I've had people come here and they ask us, like, hey, you know, check this place out. And they'll do the same for me. And I think that's what really helps our scene. We're, we're really unified. Now, don't get me wrong. When I see that GF team on the mat, I'm trying to kick their ass. We, hey, I'm, my guy's coming for them. The yeah, Badger we're team, sure. Chris, we're coming for them. And we, but we're all friends. We laugh. It's all good. Now, you said, oh, go ahead, Nico. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. You have five affiliates. Can you explain to us how affiliations work as far as you being the head of an affiliation or association? Okay, so the way it works with me, and by the way, let me shout these guys out because I don't want them mad at me. Uh, shout out to Chad Catry and Sandusky, Justin Labine and Clyde, Ohio. Um, shout out to my boy Jack Edwards in Ken, Ohio. I got to get these in. Justin Kennedy in Columbus, Aaron Janetti and Mike in Columbus. So that's five. The way it typically works with me, uh, people reach out and they've asked to work with me. Now, with that being said, and I got to shout Comprito out as well, because I just don't take anybody. You know what I mean? I, I, I want people that are good people that can wear my name and can wear the Braza patch. You know, I don't want, because we, we've seen it before where guys get money hungry and they just start taking on affiliates and things like that. I'm never going to do that. I'm blessed to be in a position. I, I have other another job, so it's not super important to me to build it up. Now, is it nice to have all these different affiliations? Absolutely. Hmm. And here's why. Because it gives me an opportunity. It gives my students an opportunity to train with different people uh, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, typically people will reach out and, you know, they'll invite you for seminars and that sort of thing. And you get a feel for them. And you kind of see what the culture is like. Does it match up with, with your vision and goal? And then we go from there. Excellent. Nice. And these places, they're like kind of all over Ohio. You were shouting Ohio. about different places, right? Yeah. Like different they're, cities. They're all in Ohio. Yep. Oh, yeah. I, I told you guys, I'm not, I'm not nationally known like you guys. You know what I mean? I'm just, I'm just a local regional guy who just really loves the art of jujitsu. And like I said, I've been watching you guys from afar. By the way, shouts out to this podcast. You guys do an outstanding job. You guys are getting high level level people on here. I'm probably the lowest level person you've interviewed so far, but it's all good though. Hey, yeah, yeah. They say it ain't easy to own a, own a business. There's a lot of black men unemployed. Uh, you know, you know, you gotta pay respect where respect's still. It's not always about being on the podium. You know, having five. Well, we like that though. Hmm. I like getting on there now. I mean, don't get me oh, wrong. Oh, no, no doubt. I'm trying to do something in these pants, so I'm, hey. <laughs> so, oh, but no. I remember oh. when my Instagram was just podium pictures. That's all I ever posted. <laughs> That's all I ever posted. Six months went by, and I was like, I guess I'm going to have to post something else. I don't know. <laughs> like, uh -huh. Span your horizons a little bit, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, see, but the thing about the COVID, and I was explaining this too, um, you know, it, it really, if you didn't take advantage of this time to develop more knowledge, to develop a different skill set, you kind of wasted your time, which, you know, you guys, like I said, I've been checking in your podcast and they've been, they've been crazy, you know, so you guys are doing a good job with this. And I'm sure you guys found out some things about yourself because you couldn't train like you once, once we're training, you know? Yeah. A lot of, uh, a lot of soul searching and a lot of uh, expanding horizons was involved. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now, with everything going on, you know, I know that you're very much involved in your community. Yes. What What role do you feel martial arts instructors play and should play in their community? Well, um, I'm big on trying to help uh, things out. Like I told you guys, it's kind of funny. I was, you know, I, uh, last year around February that I had paid for all the dog registrations. And I'm a, I'm a dog person, if you guys don't know. If you go to my IG or Facebook, I got a cane Corso named Leo, who I love to death. So, and, and, I, and I know what having a dog did for me. You know what I mean? It was, it was beautiful. I don't have kids in the house anymore. So it was nice for us to get a dog. But I think as an instructor in your community, people look at you, people you don't even know. You guys are, are world-class athletes. So the way you carry yourself 
You never know who's watching. Just because the person doesn't speak to you, that doesn't mean you're at dinner. They're not paying attention to what you're doing. Thank so you. for me, it was important because, you know, Tim, as you know, like I said, I had a son that played in the Big Ten, was a four-star athlete, and I'm on TV locally. So it's like I have to be careful because I don't need anybody posting anything crazy. But even if those things weren't happening, me as an instructor, what I do reflects my students. So if I'm out here doing something crazy or they see something, man, it's going to reflect on them. Yeah, you train at that place? So I always try to put the best foot forward. And my gym's no different than you guys. There's doctors that train with me, firefighters, cops. So, you know, we try to – and they're not going to come to places that they don't feel comfortable or that they don't trust in the instructor or the owner. So you always want to, you know, keep yourself – not to say that I'm perfect. I like to have fun. If you guys, Tim, you've been around me. You know that. <laughs> But yeah. um, you know, but at the same time, you know, there's a responsibility that comes with it because I train kids as well. So you always have to keep that in mind. I think that's something Kim, uh, Tim thinks about a lot because he, he, he works with a lot of kids. My kids I that I work with don't speak English. So, you know, I only have to worry about it. It's like, oh, is so-and-so really learning English over there? Maybe I should watch what I'm saying. Then. <laughs> you in Brazil? What? Are no, you in no, Brazil? no. I need to go. I'm supposed to be going uh, in November, but I'm still hella scared about this whole COVID thing. So it's like, we'll see. Kyle's there right now. Kyle's at my gym. Kyle's up at my social project. I'm still, uh, I'm about to DM and be like, so, uh, how's COVID? <laughs> yeah, Kyle, Kyle uh, he, he went through some tough times because out in California, it's rough there. So he's, he's had to temporarily, you know, shut down. Yeah. I just feel bad because I read a statistic that said there's over like, I don't know, like 50 gyms in the Midwest that's had to close down, you know, and man, I'm like, wow. So that's why I really count my blessings. Not only am I open, but I'm gaining people. So, yeah. And Tim, I told Tim this, Tim, Tim is like, if he ever steps out, his affiliation is going to be crazy because he's got the personality for it. He's got the technique. And, and now that I, I, I watched him teach, he understands that too, because what a lot of people don't understand is, you know, it's one thing to be a high-level athlete, but you have to be a high-level teacher, too, and a lot of people cannot communicate. We've all been to seminars with, quote-unquote, world champions, and we watch them. It's like, man, this, this guy's not really a good teacher. You know what yep. I mean? He doesn't – you know, he, he can't coach. So that's a skill set in and of itself. And for me, I think, you know, like I say, playing college basketball, my son playing college football, being around some great coaching minds – I was able to really pick up a lot of details that has transferred well over to uh, jujitsu. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Like I, I've done a lot of um, translating of private lessons in Brazil. And like, I really appreciate people that can explain positions very well. Like, cause you realize yeah. it's like, you're saying words, but none of them like actually mean anything. It's like here, there, this, that. It's like all very ambiguous. And it's like, you're just yes. talking too much. There's no actual technique. So it's like, I really learned to be like, wow, this person can really explain something very clearly, very succinctly. Like they can really pass information on very well. So that's given me like being able to work and translate and like either translate or film so many different teachers has really shown me so many different teaching styles. Good, for, for sure. I mean, you know, like we said, I mean, when I first started, any world champion that would come this way, we were flocking to the seminars and it wasn't until I really started understanding jujitsu that I realized, man, this guy really couldn't teach. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it was just understanding the game a little bit, but. You know, you guys seen it. I mean, you guys have also listened to coaches on the sidelines as your person is competing, and they're just yelling out stuff. And I'm like, okay, that you're just yelling out things. You're not really trying to navigate and coach here. So, like I said, that's the skill set I really pride myself on and, and really try to develop. Like I said, I'm in my 50s, so who cares about the Master 5 world champ black belt? No, Nobody, you know what I mean? So now it's important for me to impart things on my younger students. The legacy. All yes. about legacy. Uh, my last question for you is, is there any advice that you would give to someone that wants to venture out and be a coach? Because I, I know a common misconception is that you have to be a world champion or a world beater to become a coach. So do you have any advice to someone that has a, is inspired to teach? Yes. 
my, my, my first piece of advice would be to compete. You have to compete. I, it doesn't matter if you, you know, what the result is, but get out there because you have to be able to explain to your students how does it feel to be in that bullpen or what, what is it like, you know, be, when those nerves start jumping. And, and that's part of our job. And also, I would also encourage people to, to really seek out good coaches in football, basketball, whatever the sport is, and really study those guys. Because those guys, not only do they get talented people, they understand how to motivate. Because part of the teaching, too, is motivating. And I don't care if you're teaching math, science, jujitsu, whatever. You have to be able to motivate and convey the information so where it sticks. Because sometimes the teaching model, one size doesn't fit all. Yeah, just right. like in coaching. You know what I mean? Sometimes when I coach, you, you, Tim, you've trained with women. Sometimes... Man, the women, they get in these moves, they get in these attitudes, and I got to say, okay, let me, let me relax. I can't go like I go on this guy here. There's some people, though, some guys like that, too. But some guys, you know, you got to pound them. That's how they get excited and, and want to listen. Then other people, you got to coddle. So the instructor who doesn't have that flexibility and balance, they're not going to be successful. Got it. Point. And Excellent also, point. one more shout-out, man, Tim. Shouts out to Paul Barnett. He would be upset. Paul was the one that actually linked us the second time to get this seminar, man, coming up. So shouts out to him. And once again, you guys are doing such a great job at this podcast, man. Thanks for at least talking to me and shed some light on the Midwest. You know what I mean? It's like a lot of great, great gems out, out here. You know, you know, Mark Vibes over in Chicago. Uh, man, there's so many great places. I don't want to leave anybody out. But shouts out to Detroit. Shouts out to all of Ohio, Indiana. We're coming. So Watch how many now. of you are going down the pans? How many are you bringing down the pans? We're bringing six. Wow, you really are so, coming. Yeah, wow. Y'all flying or driving? Oh, come on, man. Oh, Tell them OG, crazy. man. I'm not driving from Ohio, man. <laughs> he uh, said master's, too. He said master's division. Uh, I forgot his back yeah, going to hurt if he drives. Oh. <laughs> you think I'm trying to sit in a car for 12 hours and then try to hop on that net? That's not how I think, man. But, uh, no, we're, we're flying down, and it's October 8th through the 11th. Why, how come you guys aren't there? Because I'm scared of coronavirus. Like, yeah, And Florida's the worst on, rep. Man. Listen. I, you're going to have to bring me back on a live and I'll talk to you guys about that coronavirus. Yeah, no, I want to know how oh it my is. God. Like, <laughs> are they, are they oh. letting a lot of people, like you can only go into the venue like the day you're competing and when with one other person, right? Still? Yes, and you have to have on a mask. Um, I watched the Austin Open. They, yeah. they, were, they were going live on that. It, it looks like it's, it's going to be small. It's going to be like, uh, you've, if you've been watching the NBA and things like that, yeah. it's not going to be huge. They're not actually um, competing with the mask on, are they, though? No, 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 no. They take I think, it off uh, and get on the mats. But yeah, the refs have to wear, yeah, the refs have to wear a face shield. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I've known some people that's had coronavirus, and, you know, they they – end up doing pretty well just make sure you guys are taking your vitamins i mean legit take your vitamins vitamin c vitamin d get that immune system up because it just seems to me that at some point everybody may get it if they haven't already had it uh so you want to be prepared for it but you know my thing is this i just wanted to to step out 2020 i, I had just started back competing i did the new orleans open and, and won my division and i was really in that competing mode that was in february and then Corona hits. And then it's like, man, I wasn't training. I started putting a little weight on and, you know, my confidence started waning. So for me, I'm just stepping out just to kind of see where I'm at. So that, you know, I, I, I wanted more students to come because we have quite a few, but I think a lot of them had some concerns as well with that, which is, yeah. which is a, a legit concern. I do, it exists. It's not a hoax. If it wasn't a hoax. <laughs> People wouldn't be asking for a vaccine. But like I said, that's a whole nother podcast. Hey, man, it's that damn 5G, bro. It's that 5G. <laughs> <laughs> how, how is it for you, you, are you guys, uh, I mean, has the mats been packed? Or, it, I will say this. Corona impacted my kids' class more than my adults because there's some parents who are scared to bring their kids. And I understand that totally. Uh, but the adults have been, you know, been coming around pretty good. I mean, the only class I really go to, there's not that many people. So, 
I don't know. But you good. train like uh, the class you're talking about, Master Lloyd's? No, I just uh, to be like super safe, man. I just take uh, the kickboxing class and have my mask on, and it's a nice train uh, change of pace. I got like people that are like kind of susceptible that I'm living around, so I'm trying to be as careful as possible. Yeah. So wherever I sure. go, someplace, it's very few people, and everyone's masked up, and we're not all sweating and on each other's grill. So, so Tim, what are what are well, what are you guys getting ready for? Did they push the ADCC back a little bit, the trials or whatever? It's postponed. Oh, okay. Now that's yeah. in Jersey, right? It was. I don't know where yeah, it is now. Yeah. Well, think about it. I, I think a lot of the tournaments now they seem to be heading to Florida and Texas because California shut down. They're the craziest um, states. That's because they're Florida and Texas have like the worst reputation, though. And see, that's the thing, like. <laughs> politics there so you know how that goes you know what i mean so that's uh but hey like pans is on the east coast now so let's keep it that way yes. let's keep yes. it that way yes man. east coast that's beast good. coast baby <laughs> man that's nice yeah then we don't have to worry about all that those time zone changes and by the way tim man you know what motive i watched that video man when i'm trying to get motivated where you're like i don't need no coaches I'm like, I still watch that, man. <laughs> hey. Oh, my God. It's a classic. It's, it's a classic, classic. man. Throwback. That out, man. I get, I get hit up about it all the time. Hey, Tim, listen, man, because the realness, people felt the realness in that video. It emanates through it. It wasn't nothing fake about it, you know? Yeah, that's what's up, man. So, listen, Dion, yeah. anything, last thing you want to shout out, where can people reach you? Where can yes. we learn more about your academy and your affiliation so you can get this Skrilla? Hey, man, listen, Ohio Brasa, just Google that. My name's going to come up. Deion Thompson, Jiu-Jitsu. Make sure you put the Jiu-Jitsu in. Don't put Deion Thompson, basketball player, because it was a guy from North Carolina with my exact name who was way more popular than I was. So, um, And just that, to you ever in Toledo, Ohio, feel free to come check me out. Feel free to check out Dante. Feel free to check out Chris Blanky. You know, we got a lot of gyms here. If you're in Michigan, there's a ton of people there. Tim, you know we having you back. Nico, you got to come with him. So you, sure, we, we got a few sure. Road you trip. I'm down with. to go yeah. train anyway. Well, we would love to have you. But like I said, thanks for having me on. It's, it's really nice. Just I'm a little guy in it, but you guys are bringing me a, a little light. So hopefully... Oh, his mic, your mic's yeah. off. Uh, oh, yeah, he did hit it. All right, now he's All right, he got oh. muted. But I real quick want to give this man a shout out as a gym owner or athletes take note. He didn't even wait for Tim to ask him to plug anything. This man been shouting out his friends <laughs> the whole episode. That's how you do the dang thing. That's how you support your friends. That's how you support your community. He ain't need nobody to ask him nothing. He was like, wait, there's five of them. Y'all gonna sit here and listen to the names and locations. <laughs> he is That's like, how you gotta do it. That's how you show love, man. That's why I always do it for the homies. That is exactly your homies, how you their love. stuff. Talk <laughs> about how great they are. That's what you gotta do. I hey, always listen. say my homies are gonna win. I always <laughs> say that they're the best in the world because I think yeah. I'm the best. And shouts out to my man, Dan Siegel, Siegel down in Columbus. Uh, Dustin, where I hit him up. See, these guys have had me for seminars too. Chad Cone, Team East Coast. Shouts out, man. So you're right. I, I got to show love because when you give love, it always comes back. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that, that's yeah. exactly how you have a successful business, a successful academy. Thank that's you guys up, so Dion. much. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming on, bro. Thank all you. right, all right. Hey, guys, BJJ Goons Podcast. Check in all the time, all right? I'll see you guys <laughs> soon. Take hey, care, Nico. Guys. Hey, man, take care. Nico, where can we find you? Anything uh, else you want to plug? Yeah, y'all can yeah. find me at No New Nico, Favela Jiu-Jitsu. We just got black hoodies back in stock. Finally, we do have some 3XL t-shirts. I know somebody was asking for it. If you wanted it, you better get them because they're completely out of stock at every single supplier. And I'm talking about like 10 suppliers. I have looked for the nice black t-shirts. I ain't bringing back them cheap, shitty Gildan t-shirts. We sticking with a nice soft Canva, but we're almost out like 3XL. Hey, when, when we get off here, I'm, I'm ordering two when we get off here. 
So you can IG me at Thompson Jiu Jitsu as well. Friend me on Deion Thompson Jiu Jitsu Facebook. Give me the information. I'm ordering too. All right, that's what's up. That's what's up. So yeah, we got the t-shirts, the extra, the three XL, all the big ones are back in stock. We got hoodies, we got sweaters. If you need a size that's not there, um, DM us and let us know. I just had to order some five XL hoodies for a friend. So we got you. You got large. We definitely got large. We definitely got that. All right. We got you. All right. We got you. Listen, you can see me and find me at Tim Spriggs BJJ on Instagram and Facebook, or go to timspriggsbjj.com for private lessons, match critiques, all that jazz. This has been the BJJ Goons Podcast. Stay safe out there, guys. Peace and blessings to all. Peace. Take care, guys.